We're here tonight with uh, Lennox Lampkin, who is an old friend, a family acquaintance, going back many, many decades. He's in Rose Hall. So, uh, Lennox, how you doing, man? I'm good. I'm, I'm, I'm hunkering down here in Rose Hall during this, this trying time, you know. How many eruptions? Because this is the 14th of April, so this has started now since last Friday, right? How many eruptions? I won't be able to tell exactly how many, but um, because some happened when while I was sleeping. But mm. um, I have recorded one, two, three, four. Um, I think I recorded about seven. Let's go back a little bit and, and just tell tell us about yourself. Um, uh, just briefly, you know, who you are. Uh, some of the travels you've done, uh, and, and how do you end up in Rose Hall? Yes, um, well, I started in Rose Hall, eh? so I ended up here as well. Uh, I left Rose Hall when I was 13, went to Kingston, uh, through secondary school, and left uh, St. Vincent in 1976 for France, spent a short period in France, and left for for the Netherlands at the end of 1976, yeah, and I I stayed I was in the I was in the Netherlands until 2005. I I saw that did just about everything, but my main um, area of focus was information technology. So I had an a, an IT company from the late 80s into 2005 when I returned to Saint Vincent. So I'm trilingual really. I speak Dutch, French, and English. And so you came back to Rose Hall, and what what are you doing in Rose Hall right now? Well, I bought a five acre, a small five acre farm, and uh, I've been focusing on growing um, eco friendly. Uh, I'd say uh, using organic uh, principles. I've been trying to regenerate a lot of indigenous fruits, things like mommy apple, things that people have forgotten, um, and uh, the focus is really on producing food for uh for health so that's my that's been my focus so i have a lot of guavas uh, uh quite a lot of sour sap um, and uh, avocados those are the three main crops but i have just a little bit of everything plum rose mammy apple pomegranates uh, you name it i've got it on farm but these these come from pretty mature trees right so how long you had the farm and how long did it take to grow it took me 10 years to be where I am today, but uh, I'm pra practically, I, the, the devastation of the uh, volcano, I would have to um, really evaluate uh, uh, where I am in the next uh, couple of weeks, hopefully, if this uh, dies down, because I've had a tremendous amount of damage. You've been watching this development and the emergence of the new plug in the crater, the black area. The dome. Um, and w do you remember what it was like when you first heard of this this new sort of growth uh, in yeah, well, the crater? I, I, we, we had uh, observed it since uh, just after Christmas in 2020. Uh, we've ob observed something strange going on on, on the top of the crater because it was um, sort of smoking, but uh, it used to do that off and on. But in the last month, it uh, became very became very consistent. And in the in the in the period uh, since they they said that the, the volcano was in an effusive eruption, um, we have seen a development, uh, a growth in the, even the visuals from 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 far off. We could see that something was happening, and it was in it is increasing. UV seismic came in, and uh, they they started floating photos around over the dome and how fast it was growing internally uh, but um, uh, in my view um, it escalated pretty fast in the last say two weeks and um, uh, it culminated in, in in an evacuation order late on thursday morning uh, with it erupting on eight at 8 45 on friday friday morning giving people very very limited time to um to do to, to uh, plan anything yeah i looked at the dome and it 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 looked like it grew quite a bit it must have been if, if you compare it to 1979 it took a lot longer for it to get to that eruptive phase it took years when when it started erupting effusively in 1971 there was a lake there i think it was a hundred and something meters deep 
so there's a lot of water there that uh, that were, that took out a lot of the heat out of the the, um, the, the process. So it took some time, and uh, when it dried out in 1979, it uh, it actually went violent. In this mm -hmm. case, it has been uh, quite a lot of material was already covering the internal, so uh, the heat was developing under under all of this magma that was coming out. You know, so I I expected it to to explode. So uh, take me back to the the first eruption that we saw. It was on the Thursday. Thursday uh, at 8:45 in the morning. Mm -hmm. Where were you when that happened? I was in, I was on farm, so I, I took a shot of the first blast. So I have that as well on, as well on record, and I streamed the, um, the first eruption live on Facebook. And uh, what were you thinking? Well, What's going through point, your mind? Because this uh, is not the first time, right? You were there in 1979. Uh, no, I wasn't here in 79. I was here in oh, 71. You were, oh, you were no, in, I was um... in the cadets in 71. So I remember the process in 71, but I wasn't here in 1979. So all I was going on was what people said uh, happened in 1979. So I thought, well, you know, that uh, I would stick around, you know, uh, mm -hmm. if that is what uh, what it's going to be. But it's uh, it turned out to be far worse. Um, the, and it's still it's still in progress. Today I, I was observing something like a flow coming down on the um, on the west on the west end, you know. So we have pyro we had we, we we had a lot of ash, a lot of ash. I had about I I estimated when I went to 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 see what happened on Sunday because on Saturday night we had some serious serious um, explosions and eruptions and I don't know how many took place that night, but quite a lot. And I had about six inches of, uh, of ash on on farm. And the trees oh, were really breaking down because in the night it, it rained a little bit and the weight of the ash just tore the trees down. Large limbs just broken down, you know. So so this is really the first time you've seen This is the first time I've seen it up close and, and personal, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I remember seeing it myself in 1979. i never seen anything like it. Okay. Uh, so now, what's going through your mind, Lennox? You got to take us back. What are you thinking now? You think you got to you got to run? You got to stay? You got animals? You got a farm? You got a business? You got your house? You got your neighbors? You got your town? What, what's how are you how are you making a calculation to stay in Rosal? Well, as opposed to uh, it, I, I am evaluating it day by day, but um, so far so good. I mean, uh, I've had uh, water in the pipes up until this morning, uh, and that is disconnected now. So. I I was I was more prepared than many because I have about a thousand gallons of water stored, five hundred for the animals and five hundred for myself. So, um, but the reason I really stuck around was that I have rabbits and I have a, I have sixteen sheep on the farm because I integrate that into the, the the whole farming process to to be able to farm organically. I use organic manure mostly, you know. So and and I I I, I use the, the the sheep to keep down um, the growth on the farm. So because I do I'm planting quite a bit of citrus, which has reached almost some of the limes are producing grapefruit and orange, which and tangerines will soon soon come to fruition. So that's the that's the position. So I decided by having only a few hours lead time, I didn't have enough time to plan to to move animals and I didn't have the logistics either. I didn't have the truck to, to move 16 sheep and there was no help uh, forthcoming from the Ministry of Agriculture either, even in the, in the period before before the eruption. Because I was I was talking about that also on, on Facebook. Uh, look if you if you so so uh, if you expect a, um I I if you expect um an eruption then we should be looking at at providing transportation and logistics to farmers. I had already arranged two different places I could have brought the animals, but just didn't have the logistical uh, support to do it. So I stayed. What's it like for the animals? Well, it, it, it's tough what I'm doing now, because remember all the, um, all the grass is covered in, uh, in ash, so they can't graze, they can't low graze. But, um, <laughs> 
maybe a blessing in disguise. A lot of the avocado trees, the, the, the limbs broke down under the weight of ash. So what I'm doing now is chopping off the limbs that I'd lose anyway. Shake them off or wash them off where possible and and show them for the for the sheep. And that's where they, they've been eating the last couple of days. Remember, we, we are in North Leeward, you don't have uh, much of a... There isn't any support over uh, past Belial. No support at all. So the government, whatever assistance they're giving or they propose to give to farmers, they're not giving any support in the orange zone. Yeah, And if you go to the orange zone, they're not letting you back in. So it's a serious dilemma. So I, you can't even put them on alternative food because if you go to get the feed, you would be out to the feed uh, outside the zone and can't get back in. So... At the moment, what I'm trying to do is uh, see how, how if, if, if rain falls and the sheep, I just let them go. I let them, at least most of them are free, free roaming really anyway. But uh, I tie one or two so because sheep tend to stick together. So if there's one or two tied, the others would, wouldn't go off farm. So that is really, so I have to feed the, one that, the ones that I tie. That's really my strategy right now and the rest would spend for themselves. Wow, and but you haven't lost any uh, any animals. I lost three. They were I had a, birds on the day of the eruption. Um, three of them gave birth to uh, to lambs, and um, one was uh, eaten by a dog because the people started letting go dogs anyway. Was it the day after they was? Yeah, yeah, and um, um, uh, two two died because of the stress. So I managed to save three of them. You know, so I have 16 sheep, you know, and I am um, trying and hoping that things would just simmer down. But we had a, uh, a pretty massive eruption around noon today, mm -hmm. uh, 14th, yeah. And um, that uh, that also produced a lot of ash. But um, I, I, I know it will reach Chattable but I didn't uh, see very much here in Rose, all of it, you know. When you say reach Chateaubriand, what do you mean? Not the pyroclastic flows? No, no, no. I'm talking about ash, ash fall. Oh, okay. okay. Because what, what happened in the in the beginning, the first eruption, say on Thursday, on Friday the, the 9th at mm -hmm. 8.45 around a.m., the first eruption looked a little bit like a spiral because the vent was very small. And because the vent was very small, it pushed the, um, the, the material very high into the sky, some 25,000 feet, I, I heard. Uh, that. So uh, that force eruption, because it went so high, the dispersion was very wide. It, uh, it had a, a diameter of about 400, 450 kilometers. That is why it went over Barbados, Barbados being 160 kilometers to the east. And uh, it went right across Barbados, so you're talking about 180 kilometers and, and beyond. And that is, that is against the prevalent wind, wind direction. But at that, at that altitude, um, the, wind, the winds are different than, than the low altitude wind. I, I'm saying this to explain what's happening right now. Um, as the vent of the crater uh, expands and gets larger, uh, when there is an eruption, um, it is it comes out less forcefully, uh, but not ne less material, but less forcefully, and uh, that means that the, it doesn't get to the altitude of the force eruptions. Uh, so the dispersion is mostly local. It's, so it would hit maybe Saint Lucia, which is uh, 21 miles uh, 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 further up, it's about 32 kilometers. And a lot of it went into the sea and uh, dispersed around the, the Suffering Mountain uh, itself, right down into Fitchews and part of Chateaubriand. I see. It's likely that the next time we go up to Suffering, the crater is going to be very, very much rearranged. Very much rearranged. I think the, 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 the western, the northwestern bank has, has uh, partially collapsed, I understand. The dome inside has collapsed into the hole. The, the new um, uh, the new hole that was created as as it blasts, what was on the side of it is now falling back down into the hole, and that is creating new eruptions because it closes off the vent. 
And when heat develops, then it uh, erupts and blows that out. So that's what is happening. The force eruption was very the force eruption on the eight on the um eight, at eight forty five on Friday. Uh, that one produced a lot of sandy light material, very rough uh, sand. And mm -hmm. as the eruptions proceeded into um, Friday night into Saturday, um, the the ash became very very powdery. It looks almost like cement. So that's what we have mm -hmm. on the roads, you know, um, quite a lot of it. And uh, on Sunday, we had a slight drizzle, slight drizzle in the morning. So you could have driven on the road and you didn't have a lot of dust. But uh, where we are now, uh, you just have to walk and there's a whole lot of dust uh, being produced. So you can't move around as, as we used to. So that's the situation. Now, now how, how, what's your estimate of how many people remain in Rose Hall now? Um, the police are saying about uh, 10%, which was put it at about 100. I, I think it's about 50, 50, 60 persons. Uh, mostly, uh, um, well, I think only male, men who are farming. Uh, and they seem they seem less concerned. Than, than, so the, the feeling among them is quite relaxed. But uh, a small group of them are determined not to go anywhere. And what do you think their main motivation is? They just feel number one is it's perhaps not a not as big a danger as everyone thinks, or they have material they want to secure. Or... I think uh, people stay behind for security, and both economic and uh, food security. Those are the two main motives for staying behind, uh, because historically, uh, based on past uh, disasters like this, people tend to they always have a group of bandits who break in people's houses, take their valuables, and uh, and people who eat other people's livestock. So people stick, who have these valuables, they stick around. So mm -hmm. that, I think, so the, so the main reason for sticking around is security, you know? And added to that, uh, the, the volatile political um, uh, climate in St. Vincent has led to uh, serious levels of distrust in the, in the authorities. And that too has uh, has caused some people to just stay behind. If you notice, uh, they they claim they had, uh, were to Europe, they were to um, evacuate sixteen thousand people, and of that only less than four thousand are in the shelters. So the others, uh, I I heard of a house in Barley that has thirty people in it. You know, a house that normally three or four persons would be in is now housing 30 persons I ordered from the Red Cross. And the reason for, for that is that people just don't want to go into the shelters for, to, the, to, to, to begin with. The government was forcing everybody to vaccinate uh, before you go into a shelter. And persons who didn't want to get vaccinated uh, and just found somewhere else, they preferred to sleep on the street and to go into the shelters. The stories are horrific. Now, is that still the policy of the government to require they're still vaccination? Pushing that. They're, still, they're still pushing that policy. And um, they, were, they were actually saying that uh, if you don't vaccinate, you can't be evacuated off island. That was one of the first things they, they came out with on the same day. Uh, it's like uh, you, 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 you announce an evacuation um, process on on the end of the day on the 8th, and people have to get vaccinated if they want to get um, um, to be evacuated uh, between that time and, and, and 8 o'clock in the morning. So people had no time to think. So a lot of people just went wherever they could go and just didn't bother to go to the, to the, to the, um, to the shelters. And, uh, and there's a lot of horror stories on uh, being related on, on, on radio because it's, um, it is a disaster in many, many ways because we have problems with water. And I've been warning about this so for, for years. I started a crusade here since in 2009, um, asking uh, the government to assess, assist people to buffer water at the home level. And uh, instead of uh, helping, they were purchasing um, tanks in Trinidad and selling it at 200 or something percent markup. The government. And that is ridiculous. And just last year, we I had a run-in with, uh, with CWSC because we had on two 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 years in a stretch we had serious drought, 
and they were encouraging people to buy tanks, but they were selling the, the tanks at 200% uh, markup. And uh, mm -hmm. after publicizing it, they, they cut the markup to, to uh, now to between 103 and 124%. I'm following it because I checked the retail prices in Trinidad and I'm comparing, comparing retail prices. Uh, but if you buy wholesale, the markup is actually higher. And that has been a problem because months, if you go online and you look at my um, my Facebook page, you see that I've been saying that for months since the since they were talking about um, unfusive eruption in December. Look, help people to buy these things, and and I even suggested um, people paying uh, the cost price, and the CWS is probably charging five dollars a month just to make the the margin you know, over a three year period or something like that, and none of it was taken up. So a lot of people are unprepared, and now the water systems are not only um, con um, contaminated or, or compromised, uh, the, the ash has, has fallen trees all over the place and and uh, destroyed lines and, and, and stuff. So right now, not what is out, uh, Mallorca was out, There's all the major water systems are out, and people don't have the buffer. Okay, so when you say the CWS, so you mean the Central Water and Sewage Authority? Sewage Authority, Authority yeah. Okay, so now let's go back to this water situation. Why does uh, uh, this kind of volcanic ash impact the water? How do, doesn't the water come from the rivers? How, yes, how is it impacting the water? Maybe right, you can right. explain if, to imagine, us. Imagine the, the ash fall is, is comp there's no nook or cranny in this and that is not filled with ash, you know? So the, the ash is all over the forest. And not only is it all over the forest, the very, the very trees that are um, um, creating your, 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 your watershed, those are under pressure from the same ash, so they're they breaking down. So I see problems not only now, but problems going forward. Because you're gonna to have to rebuild your forests. Right. Now, do you think that, do you think we're going to have, because the Leeward side has, has always been good with water. There's lots of rivers, um, good, strong watershed. Do you foresee a, a long-term problem with water beyond, like, let's say the next four or five months? Yes, absolutely. Um, <laughs> not only that, um, we are now, today is the 14th of April, so we about... 40 something days off from the 2021 uh, hurricane season. Just mm -hmm. imagine if we have heavy rainfall uh, in a forest where you have trees that are broken down. You could imagine the devastation we've been looking at. Huh? And that is going to impact heavily on food production. Already because we have lost all we had on the ground uh, from the ash fall. But even your production, even production starts up, we're going to have to be very, very careful because most of the agricultural production is done in the, in the so-called orange and, and, and red zones because mm -hmm. those are the ones that are in the northern, northern range where the volcanic soil is very rich and uh, water is available. The mountains are higher, so you have uh, spring water. Now, if you, maybe you could explain to us how, for example, let's, let's just go back to food for a second. Um, what, are, what are the main food consumed by Vincentians that are produced locally? Um, still, uh, even now, uh, bananas, hmm? things like bananas, pumpkins. There's also stuff like breadfruit, fruit, uh, breadfruit. You have uh, melons, all that sort of stuff, cucumbers, uh, tomatoes, but sweet potatoes, the tubers too, the roots and tubers. Um, mm -hmm. Those, you see the problem with the roots and tubers is that they take a little longer. So it's four, four to six months. So, um, and people are just replanting. So what it's going to do is going to affect the, the time frame in which you could produce food so i am going to i am i am anticipating we're going to have a serious gap for about six to seven months yeah for the short crops mm -hmm. and for the long crops two to three years 
Now let's talk about bananas. The, the banana tree is not typically a very strong tree. No, but uh, uh, what no, what ahead. kind of impact has this ash had? Uh, you think on the banana trees in the in the island? Tremendous, tremendous. The banana trees, we're gonna have to chop them down and let them grow back. The leaves are all hanging, drooping, and uh, uh, some have broken down under the um under the the weight of the ash. Because what's happening? You know, the ash stuck onto the leaves because there was a little bit of rain. And that extra weight pulled down some of my banana. I have some wonderful grandma shell and I just have to chop them down. As soon as this is finished, uh, they're so they're so badly damaged that you you would just have to chop them. But uh, bananas would re re recover because you, when you chop them, the the remember it's not really a tree. It just the leaves just go back out from the center. So I'm not so worried about bananas. What I'm more worried about is things like avocados. Um, they are in the period now of bloom, and I'll tell you, we have a double whammy here because because we had um, in the last year an outbreak of dengue fever in St. Vincent. The Ministry of Health was fogging uh, left, right, and centre every 12 to 14 days. They were fogging Chateaublay and Fitous on on a, on a Monday. They were fogging Chateaublay on a on a Tuesday. They were fogging in Pitybdale on a Wednesday, and all these three uh, foggings, I could smell all three of them in Rosal. Is that amount of malatheon they were putting in the air? What that what that did in the last months, all the small flowered um, fruit trees stopped producing because we didn't have bees. They knocked out all the pollinators. So I used to produce in a, in a guava season five, six thousand pounds of guavas. I had none this year. None. Mm. Mm. So that 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 in itself that that came and 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 then the, the eruption came, and I wouldn't want to see what is going to happen to the bees. There's not going to be very many left because there's nothing for them to to go out and the, the flowers are all gone. So the pollinators are going to die off. Because they now have to, wherever hive, some of the hives may be under ash, you know. So uh, production of fruits and vegetables is going to be uh, minimal after this uh, period because they, they, there are no pollinators around. Hmm. You see, we have to connect the dots, and that's why it's not it's not happening. People are not understanding the, the the wider impact of of this on 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 the whole food chain and the whole on life in itself. The only things I've seen uh, around quite a bit uh, at this point in time is birds. Birds and mosquitoes seem to be very resilient, you know? So now is the food disruption um, pretty much island-wide, or you say the North Leeward side has been hit harder, even though it produces most of the food? Is the, is the food production on the south side of the island Spare to the degree that it could replace what is lost in the north. There is no production, no real production in the south. No real food production. Really, it's 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 insignificant. On the windward side, north of um, say Mespo area, that's where the food is. And on the leeward side, you have some production in the Pembroke area, there, Vermont. There's some there. But they also had a serious amount of ash. Um, they may recover a little faster than us, but uh, generally the production comes from the north, the upper half of the country. That is the rural area. The, the, the southern area, the southern area is mostly urban. People who are working in the in the public service and so they live around that area. They're not farming. They may have lands, but they're not really producing any food. Now, t talk to me about the um, impact it had on, on like the pets, the dogs, cats, those household animals. Tremendous. People left some, suddenly. Some people left, people suddenly, left suddenly. Left them behind. Some, I'm telling you, some, I, was, I wrote something about it, I think, yesterday. Some people left suddenly. Some let go their dogs. Others left them tied. These are just going to starve to death. It's terrible. You know? And uh, a lot of people just let go the sheep. So the sheep, wherever little is left anywhere, the sheep are going to have to eat it. 
You know, I heard somebody fired five shots this morning and I was wondering, what the hell is this? You know, it's not too far from me. And I, I'm like, look, this, I'm like in the Wild West here, man. But, but I suspect after that, I saw a, a flock of sheep, uh, a, flock, a flock of sheep passing below me. So I was wondering what the heck is going on here. But that is the kind of situation that is created because we have no plan. Now, the, the, the fishery, um, what impact do you think does it have on the fishery in St. Vincent? Well, I, 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 I don't know. I don't know because if you have pyroclastic flow, it would uh, affect the coast, coastal uh, uh, fish stock. Um, uh, it would affect fisheries because people are displaced. The fishermen really are displaced. Uh, that, that in that way it would affect uh, because we don't know exactly how long this is going to last. And the fact is that um, my thing is that when you have a disaster like this, cleaning up should be a continuing process. You can't wait until it's finished to start cleaning up. Huh? A lot of the stuff, the a lot of the ash that's falling is useful. Why not collect it? I was planning today to collect and put in for uh, collect 300 gallons of this stuff today because that is valuable stuff. Instead, they leave it on the road and wait on the rain to wash it into the sea. Now, I don't know what impact that is going to have on the on coastal fish stock, no? but at the same time, it doesn't make any sense because this is the same stuff that creates our aggregate. Our dark sands is really volcanic uh, ash and, and stuff that, that is washed out. But we don't have people who are thinking. There are tons of this stuff on the roads. You could just shovel that up and put it in a place and let it weather. Because it's, it's pretty dusty, but if rain falls in it, it's sand you got right there. And the good thing about it is that sand doesn't have any salt. Remember when you're doing construction, you have to use sand with steel. And I don't understand why there is there's no effort whatsoever. All the government is studying is how they could get money. And nobody's come up with creative ideas about, look, this is a tragedy, but at the same time, there are certain things we could do with this, with this, with the material. Volcanic ash has value. Even for potting soil in the later, uh, after the, after the uh, event, we could, we could have stocks of that stuff added to our potting soil because it's highly mineralized. Lots, lots of minerals from the, from the depth of the, uh, the, 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 the earth, really. And we know, and historically, we, we should have known that because um, I was told by a number of farmers that they had never had better production than in 1980-81, after the 79 eruption. So it means that we are going to allow a lot of good stuff to go into the sea. But it also means that potentially you have a good uh, bumper crop ahead of you. Once this yes, kind of but settles um, I, I, I believe so too. I believe I am not um, pessimistic in 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 that. I think we could recover, but I say within it would not be in, within a shorter period as some people are anticipating. For the short crops, we're looking at uh, six months to a year, and for the long crops, we're looking at something like two to three years. And, and I tell you, one of the problems, one of the problem with that is that when people shift their eating habits to something else, yeah, sometimes they don't come back. On top of all of this, we're dealing with a COVID situation, mm -hmm. a pandemic around the entire world. Right. How does this complicate life for you in in uh, in Rose Hall? Somehow, somehow, uh, since the volcano um, uh, broke out, nobody is talking COVID. That is gone completely off the table. And you're not hearing anybody getting sick from COVID. Uh, you're not hearing anything of that sort right now, which which was something that puzzled me. Because there was a whole talk about, oh, poor COVID, COVID, COVID. And as soon as the elect, we went something worse, we were faced with something worse, nobody is talking COVID, and I'm not seeing anybody getting sick. Mm -hmm. It's really funny, but that's my observation. Now, do you, you pretty much in your house, you go to your farm, back to your house. Do you ever venture out of Rose Hall down to Trimulca, Belmont, any area? 
Yes, so I went to Trump. I went to Trumka yesterday. I'm going down to Trumka again tomorrow. But um, <laughs> I went to Rosal today. I went to the farm this 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 afternoon. When I, after I did the live, I took care of the sheep, my rabbits, and so and I'm driving a Kawasaki mule. That's an open buggy. And just from Rosal to Belmont, which is maybe a half a mile. Sometimes I was tempted to just leave the buggy on the road and walk home. The dust was everywhere. I came home, I looked like a spaceman. Dust and stuff all over. So that is really a serious problem. It's as if you're driving in, because I'd expect well the dust would be behind me. Oh no, the dust was everywhere. At one time I couldn't see, you know? So that is the situation, that, and that is really the situation. I'm saying this stuff. So I called a guy in who was who is into trucking. He, do, he builds blocks. So I called him, he said, I call, his, I call him, his phone rang out, so I called his son. And yeah, they operate a truck and they do blocks. And I said, where are you? He said, he's in Kingston. I said, guys, you should be in Rosal. You know, there's sand on the road. You know, if you come and collect the normal heat, they have an area they, 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 they normally go and collect a sand at the sea and heap it up there. I say you should be down here with your with your with your mask son, you know, and goggles. I should be collecting stuff free on the road. Because it builds I, I did my research online, it builds excellent blocks. Even better than the sea, the sea sand. They're smoother. And uh, they, you, you use less cement, uh, really. So I, I'm, I don't know. But people just sitting down and waiting for, for this to get over, and people not thinking of the possibilities. Otherwise, uh, even in the midst of this disaster, they're not looking at the possibilities that have been be before them. They wait until and it's finished and all the ashes gone, and you hear stories. And of course, it has no salt in it. It has no salt in it. It has no salt in it, and that is really. I spoke to the, the one of the lead scientists. They're just about two hundred feet from me here in Belmont, mm. and um, there's a Scottish guy there who is um, who is who, who is working at the observatory in Montserrat, and I I I I I, I asked him yesterday morning. He said, "What what? Well, what, what, can't we use this stuff for um, in the construction?" He said, yes, we do that in Montserrat. We sell this stuff. You know? I'm saying to myself, how come we... we say, he, said, he said, that is sold. He said, it's a bit dusty, but you could leave it to weather. You know? And I'm saying to myself, well, why is it we are not doing that? And and these are the things you you, you could make um, pavers from them. These small tiles that you, 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 you we call in Dutch, we call them you know, strat tiles, which you use them to build street. These, they, they call them clinkers. These are the things you could do with this stuff because it's a little bit more compact than the basin. Right. Now, since this has happened, we've seen in the last day or so some aid arriving from Martinique, from Trinidad, from certain places. Has anybody uh, contacted you or anybody in the Orange Zone provided any water or any kind of relief no, supplies they, no, nothing nothing because they they want to force people to get out and get vaccinated we are not mm -hmm. getting any assistance what's around because as soon as you 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 decide to stay you're on your own and but that is foolish if, that's but foolish correct, because yeah but correct me if i'm wrong isn't the orange zone theoretically a safe space Yes, well, the orange zone is not is not prone to plastic uh, flows, and um, uh, basically that is why the observatory is in the orange zone. I'm hundred feet from the if the observatory is right close to me, I walk there to carry them fruits. You know, but yet, no assistance to people who want to hunker down. None. Now, if you were to take up the government's offer to leave, where would you? Where would they put you? No, well, I had, I have a, I, uh, my sister-in-law lives in Kingston, so I could, uh, I could stay in Kingston. That is not the problem. 
No, but I mean, if you didn't have anybody in Kingstown, where would they not, where would they typically put you? Yeah, well, I t well, you would probably choose where. I don't know, I because they 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 have a number of shelters from Barrel up, so you could probably go to a shelter in Barrel or or whatever. Some of the people from Peterborough, I know, they are in Barrel. And that would be what a school or a church? There is a church right on the head of curtains, and um, I think a community center in Barley and and, and 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 a school. But the people are under under resource. People don't have mattresses to lie on. Some people just lying on a on a blanket on the ground. The conditions are appalling. And these people are, nowadays they talk radio, so people call in and say they, they, they don't have water, for instance. There's no water from Richmond right into Peter's Hope, none, since yesterday morning. And a lot of the other water supplies have been done for days. So there's no rolling water cutoff, it's just permanent cutoff? You, well, they, they said they, they, were, they were reconnecting the um, Hermitage, the Hermitage um, connection, which is... And, I, I, you know, we have to revisit some of the, some of the things that, that the CWSA did in the past that may not have been as um as wise as as it looked they centralized all the water supply because in 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 north leeward we had catch pit which supplied um rose all trunk and, and westwood with, with the coast hill we had um Pitabidel had their own supply just above Pitabidel there was a, a a water source that comes out of the rock they had their own water source now, what happened sometime, I think in the 80s or the 90s, they decided they're going to centralize all the water production. So they put uh, from Richmond right back to Peter's Hope, uh, became one water supply, one water um, network uh, supplied from Hermitage. And that has reduced our redundancy. Because when anytime one goes down, that's it. And water is still pouring out of the rocks in Pitabdell right now, and, it's, and that is not affected by ash. And they just left, they just destroyed the infrastructure, just didn't bother to, um, to maintain the infrastructure as a backup. These things must be documented. We have, to, we have to put these things on paper so that people would not make this, we may not live to see this happen again. But if we don't document these errors, we we'll never correct them. Now, what about the electricity grid? How stable has there been the electricity in the uh, orange zone where you are, Ross Hall? That has been pretty stable. We have had some blackouts, uh, but most of it was like uh, uh, between ten minutes and a couple hours. But um, I have been, I have, I have been having electricity all the time, practically, and internet was very good. I can't complain about either of those um, those services. Those were relatively good. The real problem is water. And that doesn't have to be so because water does not have to be centralized. Every community could have a reservoir, for instance. If you have a hundred a thousand people in a village uh, and you have a disaster and 10% and want to stay, they shouldn't have a problem with water. You should have a reservoir that supplies the village for two or three days. And if you if 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 90% of the people live leave. It should have 30, 30 days uh, supply there for, uh, for, 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 um, for the remainder. For the remainder. But you need to buffer. Hmm. And buffering is important also for, for the yearly um, the yearly hurricane outbreaks. Because when, when we have heavy rain, the water is compromised with mud. But if you buffer, if you have a buffer at the community level, every village should have a tank. If you have that buffer, it would mean that um, when there is heavy rainfall, you could cut off the input, right? And you could use the the, the buffer until it, uh, it it's um, it's used up, and by then uh, the problems with with mud would have uh, settled. You connect back and you replenish. Hmm. So, most of the people back in Rosal are farmers, you would say. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, that's the case in most urban urban communities. In in most of the villages, it's either either fisheries or 
or, or agriculture that sustains them because we, do, we don't have anything else. There's now, no other speak, industry. Speaking of other things else, I got to ask a, a kind of a, a colorful question here. What, what about the impact this is going to have on those irregular farmers, the ones that farm up in the mountain, ah, way up on... Good question, good question. Way up you in see, uh, Soufrier. That's a let, cash crop. Yeah, let me tell you something. Uh, in the last two to three years, all the young farmers have left food production to get into medical marijuana and tobacco. That has been 90% of the farming close to me. It is marijuana and tobacco. They're not farming food. So the position of uh, that, even this, now the, the few who are farming food, that's why they're going to be so badly missed. The redundancy issue is completely out. You understand what I'm saying? If you had a broader production, production base, you would recover a little bit easier. But everybody is into marijuana. Now, their crops are completely devastated. Most of them invested heavily because remember now it's, uh, it's semi-legal. So all the hills they were covered with marijuana and all of that is lost. Now, now all that farming up in what used to be pretty thick bush, mm -hmm. What impact has that had on a watershed? What impact does that have on, you know, deforestation? How, how water flows off those mountains? Yes, no, that, that, that is an issue that I, I uh, touched on in 2011. 2011, I was trying to, I, I was advocating and I continue to advocate for decriminalization of marijuana in the interest of the watershed. Because what was happening was that people were moving further and further into the watershed to escape the long arm of the law. And they were taking with them fertilizers and chemicals. And that risk of contaminating the water was real. Uh, but nobody was listening. Nobody was listening. And a lot of the problems that we have, a lot of the, the, the public health issues that we have, in this country is directly related to pesticide uh, consumption. And I say consumption because they, we use a lot of it. And quite a few of the pesticides that we allow into this country are endocrine disruptors. They disrupt people's metabolism. So even people eat um, normally, they, they become obese. We have an, a childhood obesity under five years old of 10%. You know? And high levels of, of hypertension and diabetes under 30. And it's because of, of our, our lax type of approach to, to the use of uh, pesticides and chemicals right across the board. If you get the hurricane season, ash destroying the trees on top of the deforestation that's going on since this irregular farming has been going on in marijuana, this could be a, a sort of a, a, a confluence of problems that people would never really uh, calculated well, when we see September, October roll around, right? Exactly. And look, my brother, I've been saying these things for a long time. I am, I am not happy to say that a lot of what I said, even with the eruption, came to pass. I wish I was, was wrong. But a lot of the things that are happening now, we spoke about them in, extensively in the years past. And it's, it's coming to pass right before our eyes. I'll tell you something. If, if you go online, look at my Facebook page, I had predicted that this eruption would take place in the middle of April, based on the historical data of the six eruptions that we had before. They all take place in a, in a narrow window of 41 days, from the 27th of March in 1718 to the 19 October eruption that took place on the 6th of May. And within that frame, that is when the eruption mostly take place. And the only thing I could, I could 
link to it and see that uh, that that's driving that specific time is that the sun is directly overhead the sun is in the northern equinox is in process and the sun is traveling north and we are 13 degrees north and the sun would be directly above above head somewhere around the middle of april 15 to 20 somewhere around there so though these days are hot and long and for some reason for some reason that's the time the, the eruptions take place I'm so grateful you, you took time out of your, your long day, and I know you got to get ready for tomorrow as a farmer. You got to get up early. What time do you get up, uh, Lennox? Five, 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 six o'clock, mostly. I, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. What, what, what do you have planned for the next little bit? Well, the last few days, I've been having a lot of sessions like this. Mm -hmm. A lot of sessions online. I've had, I have had three sessions with uh, radio stations and newspapers in Curacao, in Suriname, in, uh, in the Netherlands, in Canada, and I have one tomorrow planned for Fox 17. And uh, that's how it goes. So all these uh, days, people want to find out what is going on on the ground. Mm -hmm. They want to discuss what uh, the observations and and see how we could plan going forward. There's a lot of people interested in assisting. Mm -hmm. Tremendous amount. Mm -hmm. But the feeling generally is that people do not want to put the money in government's hands. That is the general feel. And on the, the ground here, people don't want to... It's sad. People don't want to go to the Nemo. So what do you advise? What is the best advice you give people that want to help? Because I know a lot of people watching this are going to want to help. Um, and yes, you're right. They're, they're a little bit skeptical about handing over money, even supplies to Nemo. What are the alternatives to Nemo? Well, um, the, that, is, that is the problem that we have right now. It's maybe the, the, the Red Cross, I, uh, I think, is one. Uh, they, and there are a number of small organizations on the ground. People are doing, a lot of people who are giving assistance are doing it direct. Mm -hmm. They're finding people, relatives are sending stuff to relatives directly. Because what is happening is that if, if, the, if, the, if the assistant goes central, there is no guarantee that people you want to help would get the help. Because uh, going back to 2013, um, after the floods, um, quite a lot of stuff came in and um, some of it ended up in the rare houses and just went, um, I was told quite a bit of it uh, expired, just remained stored and wasn't properly distributed or unevenly distributed. Some people who don't need it get it and people who really need it don't. And that is a problem. So people are now thinking, look, if I have to send in stuff, I, and I, my, I have my family on the ground or my friends on the ground, they send this stuff direct. And you cannot blame them because they have some historical problems. And, and one of it is that is probably the people at Nemo really want to do the right thing, but their hands are tied. If you look at what is happening now, for instance, we are hunkering down in the orange zone. And there's absolutely no assistance for us. They're trying to put things in place to, to force you to leave your animals and come out. And there is no guarantee whatsoever that if you leave them and you come out that um, you would get any assistance to recoup. There's no guarantee. So people, I have a friend in Trumka, he has 24 sheep, he says he sold some. And he has 24 left. He says he's not going anywhere because that is his livelihood. You get me? So mm -hmm. he, he said, I have to hunker down and see what I could get. He can't get stuff in. He had to find a way of getting somebody to bring it over Belial for him. So he brought all his sheep and got him and got him in his backyard. Now, is there any uh, boats coming in at Trimaka Bottom or at uh, yes, occasionally view or any place? Yes occasionally if you organize you could get a boat to come in but the police are stopping people on the road mm -hmm. 
And that that is very sad because I I don't have a shortage of food. As actually actually I send food to the to one send pumpkins to the to one of the shelters. Because mm -hmm. I have I have food. That is not my problem. I have food as long as you got water and I got electricity, I'm fine. You understand? So if I make the choice to stick around here, you should still I should still be able to get feed for my animals, for instance. Agreed. Now, do you have any uh, indication there's any commercial traffic coming in, any aircraft, any boats, any Federal Express, any courier service coming to well, St. Vincent right now? I don't think there's any um, air traffic coming in because the asphalt on the airport uh, uh, would not make that uh, very safe to do, you know. But um, boats, boats are coming in, boats are coming in. And boats would continue to come in because that that is not a, a big problem. Most of them, the 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 docks are in the south anyway, so uh, that shouldn't be a problem at all. Uh, we, we tend to think that this this volcano is 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 a global thing, but it's not. It's, it's, it, once you keep your ports open, other countries are open. Now, uh, if you could speak directly to. Uh the authorities, whoever might be watching, what do, you, what, what do you got to say? One last word to them. How could they help you more? Well, look, it's the lessons that we have to learn because it's very little that they could do at this point. Um, what they, anyway, what they could do for those who, the farmers, the livestock farmers who stick around in the orange zone is to provide them with some level of uh, feed support. They're doing it for people outside of the zone. They have not assisted the farmers in moving their livestock. Therefore, they should um, they should make an effort to get trucks in with feed uh, so that people could bridge the period until uh, this is over. That's what they could do right now. All right. Well, thank you so much, Lennox. I'll be touching base with you again in a couple of weeks because I want to keep this going, this conversation going. Um, we're all with you, our, our uh, your, your fellow Vincentians in the diaspora, we're all with you. We appreciate all of the information that's coming out visually from your recordings that you've made. So, you know, keep up the good work. We want you to stay safe. Okay, great, man. Thanks for having me, and um, I appreciate this as well. Take care and good night.